Welcome. Thank you all for being here in our, our panel four on the space economy. I definitely feel like uh, it is a hard act to follow uh, when the president has really laid out not only, I think, uh, for our panel, but all four of the important panels, uh, the underpinnings of why our new plan uh, is uh, the right way to go forward for the future of NASA. But we are going to make an attempt here to delve even deeper into the really meaningful aspects of why we believe the investment in uh, space, in R&D, and in the very uh, programs that the President just outlined are going to be the best to help us develop a vibrant space economy of the future. I have a wonderful panel uh, here today, and we're going to each, I'm going to ask them each to just give an overview of a few minutes so that we can start with the interaction of the panel. We do have roving microphone, so we'll ask you to use those. And, and just to begin, I, I would like to, again, sort of outline that the President's plan has this explicit goal of the creation and continuous improvement of American capabilities in space, which will open up new opportunities for the economy. And I know this is a shift that people have been talking about, certainly in the uh, 25 years of space policy development that I've been participating. And so it's exciting today to be able to talk more about those details and the research that has gone into this and the very meaningful shift that we believe will help sustain a vibrant space future for us all. The second component is really that in the way we procure uh, this commercially, our space transportation services, are to provide those incentives for improvement in commercial capabilities and uh, reduce costs. And that will allow us to develop the new private sector activities that employ these new capabilities. So it's a combined effort of the government taking what the government does best and investing in the R&D going further, faster, beyond low Earth orbit, and then utilizing the private sector uh, in its unique benefits that it brings, uh, providing that innovation uh, to take us, to take over those things that the government has historically done. So we have to, with this plan, shift from the previous architecture, and I know that's what's been difficult, but we need to adapt to uh, an, a more open architecture that will advance our capabilities, and uh, I believe that that is what the President has laid out. In addition, focusing on our R&D efforts on technologies is historically one of the real elements of, of NASA that has provided for the economic growth that the nation has seen over time, and it is time for NASA to get back to that. Uh, right now, the international market alone for commercial space products and services is $175 billion. And NASA's investment in R&D needs to help us uh, keep more of that at home. And I would also just uh, close my opening comments with a look historically that, in fact, this is not something new that uh, a shift to having more private sector involvement is something that historically has been happening within space exploration uh, since, for instance, the um, Robert Goddard's first flights that were, uh, his experiments in liquid field rockety, rocketry were funded by the Guggenheim family. And in fact, telescopes, uh, space observatories have been funded by private uh, interests uh, historically as well. So when you look at uh, the Paul Allens and Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk's and Robert Bigelow's utilizing some of their resources for exploration in space, this is really a continuation historically of what uh, we have done in this country and uh, we believe it is time to harness that uh, again, that, that energy and excitement. Uh, so I would like to invite our, our panelists to begin. We will start with Greg Juniman, who is, has a long career with the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, IFPTE. He is currently the president. He's held many positions over his 20 years there, including being the CFO. And uh, he's been president since 2003. Uh, is that correct? Be 2001. Oh my gosh, my notes are bad. Uh, and before working at IFPTE, he was employed for 17 years in Wisconsin, where he was a senior cost estimator and project planner. So Greg is going to talk to us about uh, their views of the president's program and the investment in R&D and its value to the nation. 
this on. Okay, good. Yes. Um, hello. I'm the. I was telling uh, Dale earlier, and I really feel like this. I'm. I'm really reminded of. Uh, a time, uh, I'm a union official, and I had to speak before the Wisconsin State AFL-CIO right before uh, the 2006 governor's election. And I looked at the uh, program, and it said keynote speaker, Gregory Juniman, uh, other featured speaker, Henry Aaron. And I thought, well, who's going to want to listen to what I've got to say after hearing Henry Aaron? Uh, anyway, um, so I'd like to talk about uh, our views, my union's views. Uh, we're the largest union at NASA, representing about 10,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians at NASA at, at sites across the nation about uh, our views on uh, the president's program, not necessarily from a scientific viewpoint or an economic viewpoint, uh, I guess somewhat economic, but more from, I, I think, a union rep's uh, standpoint. Because while I represent about 10,000 um, engineers and, and scientists at NASA, I also represent about 100,000 people who aren't at NASA. So they look at this program and say, why does this make sense? Uh, and in the labor movement, my union, uh, the International Federation of Professional Technical Engineers, like many other unions in this country, are interested in jobs. We are still, even though the numbers look good the last time around, uh, we're still facing very close to 10% unemployment in this country, and we consider it a major jobs crisis. So we look and say, okay, where are the jobs going to be? And what I tell my members, is that, and I really strongly believe this, NASA is the place where we can make an investment into our country, into the scientific mind. It's the only place that I think that we can do that as taxpayers, that we can invest in our own society. It's where we, I mean, again, it's where the future is going to be. It's in the creation of jobs, we all understand economically, job creation starts in the private sector. However, I've also seen in way too many cases, the private sector creates jobs and shifts them overseas. You know, so where we look to the Obama administration, uh, particularly with NASA, in the creation of jobs is, uh, you know, through this investment, is this is where we can make a real strategic investment into, uh, you know, the creation and maintenance of meaningful and lasting, sustaining jobs through new ideas, through new strategies, and through new innovation and technologies. Uh, and if, you know, it seems, and, and what I've talked about with my members, if we intend to stay a world power, we can't simply do so by the strength of will or through patriotic zeal, but it has to be through responsible investment in our own communities, in our youth, and in our own scientific minds. And I think the way that I've seen that we can do that, because again, I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, uh, space and, and uh, earth science exploration, but about the scientific and technological byproducts that come about uh, through the work at NASA. Certainly. Um, you know, again, if we just look at space exploration and earth science, that, those things alone that are done at NASA are remarkable in themselves. But looking at the technological transfers, the byproducts, I mean, we really have to stand up and see how much, uh, how much gains we can make uh, both in the country and in our various communities through jobs that are created through NASA's technological byproducts. The president mentioned almost as a lark tang, you know, but that's when I look at and see like the people who live on Main Street in Lincoln, Nebraska, they, they don't think much beyond that. I mean, they sort of see that, they see post-it notes, they heard about Michael Phelps's swimming suit that helped him to win eight gold medals, you know, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what I find remarkable is NASA's work that has led to, you know, diagnostic procedures that, that bring us early detection of breast cancer. You know, those are the sorts of things within NASA that I think that create jobs that are important. And it seems to me with all of the hoopla uh, that's, been, that's been spread about health care reform in this country, now is the perfect time you know, to look at the important uh, gains and breakthroughs that have been made, on NASA, that made by NASA on things like the early detection of breast, uh, of breast cancer and in cancer cells in men and women across this country. You know, and when I talk to some of my members who are, you know, NASA scientists, they say that, well, yeah, a lot of this has come about through their work on research on thermography. Is that right? 
Um, what's, I mean, I think that that's part of the problem. You know, you go to people, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin, and you say, let's increase the taxes so we can have more research done on thermography, you'll get thrown out of a room, right? It's like, what is that? What, what the heck is thermography? And, and it kind of reminds me of when I started as a union representative, when I was the secretary treasurer before I became the president, I met with one of my members who was complaining about management's uh, uh, escalating interference into his uh, occupational environment through systemic uh, yet innocuous uh, intrusions into his work life. And I said, oh, so they're nickel and diming you to death. And he said, oh, that's perfect. And I said, well, this is why you need a union. You can't even speak plain English, you know, uh, you know no matter how smart he is. But I'm really, in, in plain English, it, what's really being done that, that, that's incredible is um, you know, the, Cleveland's, the Cleveland Clinic is doing really great collaborative work uh, on research on heart disease. You know, with, and, and I think the only ones who know about that are the people that work there in that general area. Yet this is really important work. You know, that, that, that there's work, there's byproducts at NASA, you know, that, that come out that, um, you know, the, the, the micro batteries that are used to power uh, ro robots and satellites are used to power pacemakers. You know, and nobody knows about this stuff, and they really should. People should know about this. They should talk about this. They should understand this is why, you know, it, it's important that we have NASA beyond space exploration and Earth science. And these are where jobs can be created you know, that are going to help us, again, beyond NASA. And it's sort of like we need to answer the question why. You know, why, why is this necessary for this work to get done beyond the scientific community, to get out of the inside the baseball stuff, right? Um, you know, the um, – following my notes here. Okay. Um, so, I, and I, I do need to sort of mention this because Charlie Bolden said let's sort of like uh, dare to disagree with one another once in a while. I think very much of this uh, stuff needs to be discussed on the NASA television channel. I don't know who's in charge of that, but it's, somebody said it's like watching paint dry. I think it's more like watching dry paint because <laughs> watching paint dry would actually be something happening. I think you, know, you might I, be on it right now. So. <laughs> if I see the logo, if, okay, well, maybe I blend into how boring the things can be. Um, so, yeah, in any event, the other, and, and, and I do got to say, I mean, and I read recently, and this is sort of, I'll, I'll fault the press a bit for this. Um, I, I read recently something about that there was, that there's work being done, very much of what NASA's work is, you know, that's done, the research work has to be done, and you know this, at, at zero gravity. So work was done on the space station, I read this someplace recently, that, uh, you know, was the investigation of the HIV uh, genome. So I talked to a reporter about this from a, a nationally known publication, who I won't advertise for free, um, and said, you know, why aren't you talking about this? This could lead to the cure for HIV AIDS. And he said, everybody knows about that. I said, nobody knows about this stuff, nobody. I mean, we need to be talking about this. People need to be hearing about this, and maybe a lot of that is our fault. You know, but again, this is the sort of thing, I think, that leads to jobs, that leads to, you know, real meaningful, uh, um, need for investment in NASA. And of course, beyond all of that, I mean, and I look at my own union. I represent uh, uh, engineers and technicians outside of the medical field. My own union, I represent engineers, technicians, and scientists at Boeing and at General Electric. And the work that's done there by NASA, it, you know, into the improvement of jet engines and wing design, you know, the, the fuel efficiency gains that have been made by NASA are just incredible that have been passed on to the private sector. You know, and th th so we now have quieter, more fuel efficient uh, jet engines, you know, which means less noise pollution, less air pollution, so that as some NASA scientists are studying the effects that we're having on our own globe, you know, NASA is also taking positive action toward improving those things. I I've got friends who are in the firefighters. Uh, not only just the firefighters union, but I got friends who are firefighters. And when I look and see the sort of work that NASA is doing on flame retardant materials that firefighters can use. And, and I heard just recently that, we've, that NASA has developed these like face masks that if the firefighters on September 11th and the recovery mission had had these, they wouldn't have gotten the insides of their throats irreparably burned. You know, this is incredible stuff that NASA is doing beyond space exploration, beyond Earth science, that needs to be talked about within the general public. 
And, and if it's not being talked about, shame on us for not doing it, because I think we need to bring that out there. So this makes sense. So NASA makes sense to the people on Main Street in Lincoln, Nebraska, who are helping to pay for these things. And certainly when we look at the remarkable work that's done by NASA in space exploration in our science that I'm sure others are going to be talking about. You know, it's, it's just incredible work. And it really needs our investment, our continuous investment as a society. Because when, when I look at, when I consider um, other civilizations that have faltered throughout history, and I think it's because, in a lot of ways, it's because they stopped gazing outward in wonder and began just staring inward you know, in self-interest. And then they began to falter over time. And we can't let that happen in this country. That's why we need to make investments into our space program and Earth science because, you know, through those things, and the scientists will tell me this, and maybe a lot of people know this, that after these projects are done, and they write these technical reports and say, here's practical uses for the things that we've learned, you know, in, in, in launching this rocket or launching the space shuttle. And these things can be, you know, can be used in our general society, in general communities, in the creation of jobs, in the creation of industries, in meaningful, sustainable jobs that'll stay with this country. You know, then that seems to me to be, that's a very smart investment that we can make. You know, and, and I, I sort of look at it and think, even the most conservative Tea Party people, if they figured out only less than a penny of our each tax dollar goes into NASA. I mean, it's, it's an incredible investment. I, I also, I read recently that, uh, you, know, um, it, you know, we look at our partners where, where a lot of my members' jobs go, right? And uh, in, the na in terms of the national budget, uh, China spends about 11% of its budget on education. India spends about 9.98% of its budget on education. Japan is about 9.3% of its budget on education. In the United States, we spend about 2% of our budget on education. China will graduate, and we've got, if you think the unemployment numbers are bad now, of course, I'd, I'll just uh, uh, digress here for just a minute. The unemployment numbers in this country don't really tell the story, as we all know. That's just the measure of the people who are collecting unemployment insurance. But we're about to graduate a half a million students both out of college and out of high school, maybe it's more than that, I think it's actually millions that are gonna come onto the streets that won't be part of the unemployment numbers in this country. You know, but we're going to graduate however many engineers we're gonna get out. China will graduate about three and a half times more engineers than us. So will India. Japan, with half of our population, graduates twice as many engineers as we do. And we lose 40% of our graduates to other countries because where are they gonna get jobs? Especially if we don't invest in ourselves, invest in our, invest in our own young minds. It, it seems to me in so many ways that NASA provides sort of the, the golden eggs of our society, right? And the goose is easily fed, you know, that if we look to invest in our own futures, NASA is the way to do it. And, and I would just close by, you know, paraphrasing. Remember that great line by Albert Einstein when he talked about the high cost of an education? That I would just think, if we consider the cost of investing in our own futures, consider the alternative. And that's why my union wholeheartedly endorses the president's budget for NASA. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Well, I think if we were, when we are on NASA Watch, it won't be like watching paint dry. That uh, is an <laughs> impassioned union speech. You, we should have had a platform for you like you were in a workforce. I've met with you a number of times. Uh, this is, is your element. And so thank you so much for being here and, our, and articulating that view. I should note that Greg does have a flight to catch, so he will not be here uh, much longer. So if it's while uh, Dale is speaking, he leaves. I really believe it is not because he is disagreeing with, with <laughs> Dale's view. Uh, so, so thanks. Thanks again, yes. Uh, so our next speaker is Dale Ketchum. He is a uh, representative on the panel as a lifelong resident of Florida's Space Coast, as a graduate of the University of Florida, been involved in the space program directly or indirectly for his entire career. He was at Rockwell International working on the shuttle for a decade, worked for a uh, District Director for Congressman Jim Bacchus on the House Space Subcommittee and the former Director of Space Programs for Enterprise 
Florida, the state's economic development agency at the time. And he is currently the director of Spaceport Research and Technology Institute at the University of Central Florida. Dale, we're looking forward to your comments on our uh, future plans in space. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I guess I want to take advantage of the fact that uh, since this event is occurring in Florida, um, uh, focus on, for the most part, on the impacts to Florida. And, you know, it's happening here. This is our home court advantage. We're going to exploit it. But I think the applications are, are generally across the nation. Um, what the President's doing, from my perspective, is extremely important. And, and I, I say that in, the, in a very personal context. When my father started putting me through uh, college at the University of Florida, we've been here all our lives. So my dad moved here in 1955, and I was not very big in 1955. I learned to walk on Cocoa Beach with the original astronauts. And the, when, when he was putting me through college, it was 1972 when the Apollo program was being canceled and, and the devastation in this community was immense. I think we went from 36,000 to about 14,000 in 18 months working here at KSC and that was back when the economy was about half what it is today. And um, you know that occurred because all we did was launch, launch here. That's what KSC does, we launch. Then now I'm going to be putting my kids through college through the painful transition out of the shuttle work program. And that's going to be uh, extremely difficult. It won't be nearly as bad as the Apollo, but it's still going to hurt like heck to this community. And I guess what inspires me the most about what the President is trying to do is uh, the, the pro proposals he's put forward allow Florida to, to have a big piece of the in increased investment in research and development and technology development and to allow us to broaden our business base here at KSC so we're no longer focused stri strictly on operations. We, we now will have a, an institutionalized pieces of, of research budgets, of, of program development, of program management, and this will make it so that fortunately my kids won't have to go through the same sort of economic whipsaw that occurs when your programs cycle down for the same reason that if you, you don't, if your retirement fund is all invested in one stock, when that stock goes down, you get hammered. It'll allow Florida to be a, a much more diverse and robust and, and hopefully not even uh, solely focused on, on, on NASA as, as uh, manned space launch activity for th that particular agency. So it's inspiring to me that we're gonna finally get what a lot of us in the community have been seeking for a long time, and that's a diversified business case for NASA here in the state of Florida. Um, it, it, on a broader context, I think what the President's proposing, when, when, as we heard him today and as we listened to him, uh, some of us had the opportunity to meet with him uh, for 15, 20 minutes before he spoke. And it was a real opportunity for the President, to, who's a very approachable gentleman. I mean, he comes in with his retinue of, of Secret Service, it's rather intimidating. But he promptly walks over and starts talking to you in a very offhand manner and, and was able to effectively convey that uh, he's a genuine guy and that his statements about his investment and commitment to human spaceflight is genuine, it's personal. And, and he was able to articulate not an in-depth understanding of, of, of physical principles of you know, orbital mechanics, that's not his field, but an, a genuine understanding of the nature of the challenges that confront this industry the nature of the challenges that we're going to face trying to get out beyond low Earth orbit, and that his commitment was personal. Uh, that was encouraging to me. I think what he's talking about wanting to do, which is, is to, to bring the commercial sector into low Earth orbit, that to me resonates very well because I've been here all my life. Uh, you know, I've seen, uh, all, you know, all of the different vehicles, and, and I understand that the commercial sector is trying to develop technology that is essentially 50 years old. We've been putting humans in space for 50 years. The Russians have been doing it for longer than that. If not now, then when are we going to turn it over to the commercial sector? You've got an opportunity. You have a turning point. The shuttle is retiring. In my mind, it makes sense to do that now. Um, the, and the, the paradigm for a lot of people here is a little difficult to understand because, not difficult to understand, it's difficult it's a challenge to them because a robust commercial launch industry is not going to be a labor-intensive launch industry. It's going to be efficient, lean, 
and what we're, where we will make up the difference is in the market activity that will occur with ever-increasing launches here. If we are launching humans into space for NASA on a commercial vehicle, if we're having a robust Air Force activity, uh, I know they'd like to have more launches and get their launch rate, their launch costs down, as well as the commercial sector. The more you get that activity, the more uh, the, you will lower, as in any economic model, the more you do something, the lower is your cost going to be to do it. The more we lower the cost of payloads into space, the more people are going to want to put their payloads in space. And it, that then builds, as if we start becoming the launch cluster that we want to be here in Florida, then that will attract additional second and third tier suppliers, the vendors, they'll all want to come here. We create a, a standard economic cluster. Um, that's very encouraging to us. A lot of us, uh, when, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I think it was, I think it's safe to say more than 90% of all the commercial payloads in the, in the world, for at least the free world, were launched from Florida. Now we're less than 10%, I believe. Um, it's, you know, we've been fighting that burden for a long time. It, it's easy to point at the Air Force and say it's all your guys' fault with the range problems. That's, that's not a fair characterization. It's part of it. But, you know, we managed to create an economic system that, that wasn't good for us, but created, uh, you know, French Guiana and the Kourou launch station and, and created an environment that was great for everybody but us. And what we have now is a real opportunity. I think the president's given us the opportunity and the resources and the initiative to go forward and start to recapture a large share of that commercial marketplace. Because they do want to launch here. It's a lot more commercial providers are going to want to provide come to Florida because it's much easier to spend a week or two with your payload on the beaches of Cocoa Beach than it is in the jungles of Guiana. Uh, it's just the business model will work for us if we can get over these critical and technical challenges, but I think the president has given us the initiative, the resources, uh, and, and the direction to go do that. So that, that's particularly exciting to me. I, I use the analogy of what we were resembles a mid 20th century Detroit. It was uh, very, it was single program focused, it was very labor intensive, and what the president is, is hoping to allow us to do is transition into a more robust economic marketplace that resembles Silicon Valley. Now un understand this, it's a commercial marketplace, so we are going to have winners, we are going to have losers, we are going to have litigation, we are going to have layoffs, all the good stuff that comes with a, a robust capitalist environment. But that is exactly the sort of play environment that, that America does best in. It's exactly the sort of environment that we will best compete with the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians and everybody else uh, who's trying to get into this, the space marketplace. That, that to me is who I want competing uh, in getting into low Earth orbit and capturing the commercial marketplace in the future. Um, for KSC, I think, in, again, in particular, and my guess is it's going to apply to centers across the board. Um, KSC, as a just a launch operator, has been a rather, over the generation that we've been here, is, has been rather insular. The activity stays inside the fence. I mean, the people are very involved outside the fence, involved with their communities, their churches, their not-for-profits. But the business activity has been inside the fence, and the contractors have responded accordingly. I think what the president's proposing allows us to get more involved in research activity that will engage the local community on, on a more effective manner and integrate collectively all of us. Additionally, the, the conversations that we've been having to date talk about better integrating. Um, there have been some pilot projects run through like the NASA Shuttle Logistics Depot where they're trying to see if we can't aggregate the demand of the Air Force, uh, the Army, and NASA to address industrial base issues, because the industrial base of the United States is a big, big problem. Um, the federal government is an appallingly bad customer to the contractor community, because we're buying uh, small pieces that are very expensive, that are only ones and twos, it's, and, and you're, the, the, the prime contractor, the private sector doesn't really know, they don't have a stable, sustained, uh, requirement that they can then, you know, let go out and finance to build the capability to meet that requirement. Uh, Office of Secretary of Defense is funding some programs that will allow us to look, can we aggregate that demand so that uh, the Air Force and the Army and NASA and Department of Energy are, 
are collectively knowing what they're going to be purchasing when and can provide a more sustained demand to the private sector so that they know what their needs are going to be, what their, their big customer is going to want in the, in, in the future that they can then go out and borrow money to prepare for. And that's particularly important where that really gets into the industrial base issues is how that impacts not so much the primes but the second and third tier suppliers. That's a big problem. That's exactly why the shuttle logistics depot came into being because NASA told them, do you want to build a piece of the shuttle because we're going to fly 50 times a year and you'll be able to build lots of them. And they said, sure. And then when we ended up flying four or five times a year, they said, we don't want any part of this business because we're not making money. And the shuttle logistics depot came about because NASA had to take over responsibility for manufacturing, refurbishment, all this equipment because the private sector said, we don't want your business. And that problem is growing nationally in terms of the federal government being uh, an unattractive partner to the private sector. And if the federal government, if NASA and the Air Force are unattractive customers to the private sector, we're all going to pay for it, both with increased costs and also the industrial base, which is our primary defense. Uh, both militarily, intelligence-wise, and economically, we're undermining the primary thing that defends the United States of America. I think what the President is proposing gives us an opportunity to better integrate those activities, um, and that's good. I, I would like to see Florida lead the way because we are sort of the epicenter, at least in space, of both NASA activities, the Air Force activities, and now the commercial activities. Um, it's going to take some imagination and some innovation, but I think clearly we have a president and administration uh, where we're going to have an opportunity to come forward with good ideas. Um, and I guess I'll just sh shut up because I think the purpose of this is to get audience interaction. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, even though I um, was raised in Michigan in the mid 20th century, and uh, <laughs> I won't take it personally, but you know that I have not lived there in about 25 years, so that has something to do with it. In fact, uh, that the job creation and capability there just did not happen in time to, to keep a lot of us. Uh, our final speaker is Dr. Mae Jamison with a PhD from Cornell University, MD. Uh, an MD from Cornell University, and uh, has uh, spent two and a half years in the area of Peace Corps uh, as a medical officer for Sierra Leone. She is a veteran of the Space Shuttle Endeavor flight uh, in 1992. Uh, she's an advocate for the important role that the space program plays in inspiring a future generation of scientists and engineers. In fact, inspired me in a talk, I believe, in 1992 after your flight in Chicago once. And uh, she's the founder of the Jemison Group and helps lead projects to develop new technologies as well as bring those technologies to real people in the places where they can benefit from them the most. Uh, so May, welcome, and we look forward to your remarks. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to tell you, what I did was, you're going to finally feel comfortable here at a NASA presentation, because when I was told to speak, they asked me where were my charts, so of course I made charts, and so I hopefully will get the PowerPoint up. Um, I feel really at home now, I have to say a couple things, because um, my first job with NASA was actually at Kennedy Space Center as a C-squared, coming down all the time, uh, following the vehicles and the thermal protection system. And someone just said, um, Greg just said, you know, about being heroes. I just want to tell you, the real heroes were the folks who strapped us in. And people ask, did you feel uh, scared when you went up? And I was like, no, because you've never had so many smart, dedicated people looking after you in your life. So I just want to say thank you about all that before I get started. Um, I was asked to speak about innovation, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, our STEM education, and how the space program helps to inspire these. I want to start off by saying when you talk about innovation, um, you can go to the next slide, when you talk about innovation, it's not just about doing something new. Innovation has to be different. The quote that you see up there is, while other nations are trying to reach the moon, we are trying to reach the village. That quote was in the 1960s by Julius Nyeri, who was the president of Tanzania. The reason I bring it up is because when I left NASA, the first thing I did was to teach a course at Dartmouth that was called Space Age Technologies in Developing Countries. I spent time overseas, but people never started to think about, again, how these technologies impact us in lots of different ways. And so I wanted my students to take 
advanced technologies and figure out how do we use them for development work, place things that don't seem to go together. So one of the students, um, they worked on things like looking at can we use satellite-based telecommunications. This sounds really easy right now, but this was back in 1993-94. Can we use satellite-based technologies to help look at delivering medical care or facilitating medical care. So they design whole systems around it. They have to learn about development work as well as um, being overseas. We go to the next page. And so what we've heard today, I'm not going to talk about the amount of money and R&D and what happens in terms of, you know, for every dollar that goes into NASA, seven to ten appear in the U.S. economy. We know those kind of statistics. I've had people do a much better job here than I would do initially. But let's say that it is not really sufficient just to think about space exploration in terms of its uh, impact in economic terms. Space exploration benefits also have to be considered from the perspective of improving quality of life. So we heard about some of the things called spin-offs and things like that. But how do we bring it down so people understand that it improves quality of life? Well, we can talk about things from um, medical imaging, we can talk about things people take for granted, like GPS systems, weather satellites. And I'm, I'm in Houston, Texas. I know here in Florida you guys know a whole lot more about hurricanes than sometimes I do in Houston. But just right now with Hurricane Ike, some of the issues associated with getting people out on time, understanding what was happening, really came from weather satellites. And people forget when they're looking at those images that those weather satellites are in space, which is really interesting. But those change and affect our quality of life. Those are the issues that people really understand. Um, it's nice when we say the really big words, and, but it's the quality of life that makes a difference. And that's what we want to talk about. While I was uh, teaching, I put together a project called Seeing the Future, Science, Engineering, and Education, and that was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Science Foundation, which predated NASA a little bit. And, um, that, one of the things that happened at that program, we had a, a bunch of scientists from all over the place, um, National Medal of Technology, National Medal of Science winners. Uh, one of them won a Nobel Prize later. They were coming up ide with ideas where what are the best uses for science and, in, and technology funding, R&D funding from the government for basic research. They came up with a list of things that it ought to do and questions that ought to be applied to these kinds of programs. One of the things was, does it create a tool? Does this research or this development, does it create a tool that allows other scientists to do more work? And in fact, the way one of the participants put it is, the one scientist's tools becomes a next scientist's basic research. We can ask ourselves, does NASA do that? The other uh, question they asked was, does it impact science and technology education? That research funding should impact beneficially science and technology education, and they thought that that was a requirement. So I'm going to put start to look at a couple of different specifics that you might not have paid attention to or thought had a lot to do with NASA. The reason I said MD is because the next slide is going to focus in on life sciences and space exploration. I just want to take a little area that we probably don't think about very much and talk about how innovation has you know, from the space program has affected life on Earth and how it could do more if we pay attention to it. So when you look at life sciences and space exploration, they're incredible opportunities and challenges. But basically, what we pay attention to for life sciences in space exploration is the fact that we're putting people in unusual environments. You know, astronauts may not be Olympic athlete healthy, but they're physiologically healthy, right? So we're putting them in usual environments, seeing what happens to their, to their bodies. They're in closed and isolated systems, so now we have to understand from a life scientist perspective, how do we make sure that those you know, systems are refreshed? How do we feed them? There's a whole bunch of things that go on that are purely life science driven in terms of getting people into space. Then we can talk about the vantage point of space, and that's what I'm going to come back to. The last one I have is exobiology. You know, when you go down to the basis of life sciences, what is life? Can we identify it? You know, am I, I could say teasingly, you know, am I going to find Worf or Mr. Spock, depending on how we look at it. But can we actively understand what are some of the basic principles? Those things start to fundamentally affect all that we do, what we look at. But let's go to the idea of the vantage point of space. 
So all of a sudden, I'm here up in space, and I can look back down at the Earth. What can I do with that? If we go to the next slide, there is a field called landscape epidemiology. And so I wanted to just tell you something you might not think about, space-based remote sensing for health on Earth. You know, how am I going to be up on orbit and actually understand some of the impacts on Earth? Think about it. Remote sensing, I know everybody in here, there are a lot of experts on remote sensing and things. Remote sensing, you look at some characteristics of plants and ge um, minerals and things on the ground, and you can infer a lot about the environment or the climate from that. What some really innovative people have been able to do is say, let's look at malaria transmission, because mosquitoes need very specific kinds of requirements, right? So these are just a few. Schistosomiasis, a nasty disease that's uh, transmitted by snails, but it's associated with water and where water is done. You can understand a lot about the transmission of the diseases. Environmental determinants of Lyme disease. When Lyme disease, one of those things that we hear about every day up in New England, it, it, it turns out that you need sort of contiguous areas where deer get to be in contact with humans. If you don't have that, it doesn't happen. So you can even try to expect where you would have outbreaks of Lyme disease, leishmaniasis and Chagas disease, remote sensing of scrap tires. That doesn't fit in there. Yeah, it does, because scrap tires become a reservoir for all kinds of other pathogens. So just thinking of it, here's a platform space technologies, remote sensing that allows us to do something that we would not have a good handle on. Imagine standing down and counting mosquitoes to find out whether or not you're going to have an, an epidemic when you could sort of look at the geography, you can look at the environment from space. The other one I thought was just really interesting was tracking the, the, the spread of cholera and when you may have cholera outbreaks. Um, so what you want to do is if you can look at Vibrio cholera, it has this, it's one of the, you know, when they're talking about the cholera outbreaks that we expect after earthquakes and various other things. It attaches to zooplankton, small animals. Zooplankton eat phytoplankton, and you can see phytoplankton from space. You can see blooms, and they've been able to actually predict cholera epidemics from that. I bring these up because that's, these are one of the areas that I don't think that we necessarily pay attention to and think have anything to do with innovation in space. So innovation comes in many different forms and fashions, but one of the things that we also need to do with our space program and that one of the things it does very well is to support science education, STEMs, science, technology, engineering, mathematics education. If we look at the next slide, this quote is about a meaningful science education. It integrates a student's intellects, their emotions, their interests, and their skills to reproduce a significant sense of achievement and growth. It bolsters the student's confidence in their own ability to think, to feel, to take action, and to cope with future challenges. It promotes self-esteem. I put this quote here because Dr. Cheryl Morrow was actually an astrophysicist who was at NASA in their education department when she was looking at what should we do for science education. And this was way back in the, the um, in like 1994. And so NASA's programs do that. I'm sitting here and I have the pleasure of being here with Bob Cabana, um, who was an astronaut. In fact, he's one of, my, one of my bosses also when I was in the astronaut program, who's here you now as the center director. Uh, Leland Melvin, I believe, is in the room. One of the things astronauts are required to do and pay a lot of attention to is science education and how do we do outreach. And that actually sticks with us. NASA has very interesting programs um, that um, outreach to people. If we go to the next slide, I want to tell you about a couple of those programs, and then I'm going to tell you about um, programs that I've been doing afterwards, because Charlie Bolton asked me to. Um, this is one program that's interesting. It's the NASA Spelman College Women in Science and Engineering program. You see on the side that there are two studies that I'm mentioning here. One is American Association of University Women study that's called Why So Few? Why we don't take advantage, full advantage of the kinds of people that we have in this country, women, in terms of being uh, scientists and engineers. And then there's a Bayer Facts of Science, which is a survey of women and underrepresented minority chemists and chemical engineers. Those studies came out on about the same day uh, last month. Those studies said that if we want to improve 
the diversity of our scientific workforce, then we need to do a number of things. This is when you all boil it down. Those studies said that we can, we can recruit more people, but we have to make sure that they have the exposure to the science fields, they have experience in those fields, and there's an expectation that they're gonna do well. And so I bring up this WISE program because since 1987, it's been able to graduate 380 women from Spelman College. Spelman College, if you don't know, is one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country. Um, but it's a small college founded for African American women a number of years ago. And this program, in connection with Georgia Tech, has graduated over 380 women who have gone on, 60% of them gone on to get graduate degrees in engineering or the sciences, and 40 have become, uh, gotten their PhDs, and on top of that, they have presidential early career award winners and a number of other things. This program has been really exciting, and in fact, uh, Dr. Kelly Bolden, who is uh, General Bolden's daughter, Administrator Boulder's daughter, went through that program a number of years ago and graduated as a chemical engineer and went on to become a plastic surgeon. So I bring this program up because it provides internships, because NASA is there, it says that we're expecting that these students, that these girls will do well in the sciences, right? And it exposes them to a number of the myriad of careers that are available. I want to say one other thing about STEM education and NASA's ability to improve diversity. I want to go back to the beginning of NASA. I had the pleasure of narrating this program uh, on National Public Radio. It's called Race and the Space Race, the unlikely story of the civil rights movement in NASA. Uh, what's going on here? Because NASA was in the South, primarily its headquarters, its facilities were in the South, NASA also had a mandate to make sure that they brought in other kinds of folks, right? And so NASA sort of required that communities right here in, you know, Brevard County, other places, that they have African Americans and others in the program. So it really caused communities and installations to change the way they do things, even in Marshall Space Flight Center, at Johnson Space Flight Center. It was something that pushed the barriers when, you know, perhaps we weren't even thinking that they could be pushed in that same way. So I bring that up because it's important. So I also said that, you know, once you pay attention to this stuff, it sort of sticks to you, it hits and sticks. So when I left NASA, besides some of the other things I did, one of the things I was committed to was science and technology uh, education. And I always was interested in science literacy. So I want to just talk about a couple of programs. Charlie asked me to make sure I talk about a couple of, okay, a couple of programs I have. One is called The Earth We Share. You can put it on the next slide, and you can just going to cycle through some of the pictures of students who come from all around the world, and they work on global dilemmas like predict the hot public stocks the year 2030, design the world's perfect house. I'm not sure how the pictures are going through. You can just keep flipping through them. But what the students do is they actually have to come, and they work for four weeks, and we've trained teachers. The reason why this is really important, and Charlie wanted me to tell you about it, is because it's, it's about science literacy. It's about all students becoming literate in science, not just about the next generation of professional scientists. And the last, if we go to the next slide, if we go all the way through it, this young man was um, someone who could have gone to a basketball camp. He was a basketball star in New York City, but he wanted to go to a science program because he thought that was important, but we needed to have it there. And if we go to the final slide with, and flip through this, this was a program called Celebrating Women of Color in Flight Girls Day Out. We were talking about changing our adding to the face of who does aviation and aerospace. So many times people don't think of women as being involved in aviation and aerospace, and they also think of the jobs as only being those that are PhDs and and uh, graduate degrees. But the people who I counted on to keep me safe from because they put on the tile on the shuttle or dressed me in my suit, they were high school graduates. And so what we wanted to do was to change the ideas of who could do 
space exploration and what kinds of jobs you could be involved with. So we had people from a uh, woman who was the second ra highest ranking person in the Indian Air Force all the way to the woman who actually was my suit tech at Kennedy Space Center. And they all came and helped to change the face of what we think of aviation aerospace. And so if we find it, finally end up with the last slide, what I would say is, uh, I guess we didn't change the girls' day out. Okay, it's gonna, you can flip through those really quickly. That's what happens when you don't have control of your own. Uh, you can keep going. It's just like nice pictures of people. See, I can't. Can you all see? Okay. And But NASA was one of the things that really supported, that got them excited about it. So Julius Nereri said while other people are trying to reach the moon, they're trying to reach the village. I think that by not only reaching for the moon but beyond, we can make the quality of life better in the village, whether we talk about here in the small places here in the U.S., large villages, villages like New York City, or if we go overseas, it's how we apply it. It's the innovation, the STEM education, and the inspiration that we provide. Thank you so much, May. The societal benefits that you mentioned are definitely a key part of the President's plan moving forward. And if I can, in our remaining time, try uh, to allow a couple of you to be able to participate with us. I want to highlight some of the specific areas for uh, Florida in addition to what Dale talked about. Specifically, we have several aspects of our plan and our budget going forward, the first being the 21st century launch complex. And a lot of what talk, was talked about here are things that will be uh, made available because of this investment. And we uniquely have the head of the Kennedy Space Center here, so I'm interested in uh, getting a microphone up front, first of all, for uh, Bob Cabana. If you could talk to us a little bit, Bob, about uh, NASA's investment over the next five years in the 21st Century Launch Complex, the 1.9 billion here in Florida. Um, what do you think the benefits are gonna be of this investment, and um, what will they have, both for launch operations on the Space Coast, and if I could after, um, since we have also uh, General Kaler here, having him respond as well. Thanks. Sure, Laurie. Well, as soon as the President's budget came out, we started looking at what can we do to become more efficient and improve our facilities. And we need to do it for a number of reasons. Uh, first off, as Dale said, we have to diversify. But if we're going to attract business into the future and really have a vibrant space program, we have to learn how to be more efficient and do it better. And we've got 1960s architecture down here. There's a lot of improvements we can make to the pad, a lot of ways that we can do things better. And if you look at the range and, uh, you know, what we run into of trying to schedule and how we can work better in that regard, too, with today's technology, I think there's a lot, lot of opportunity for us to uh, cooperate with the Air Force. And we have a tremendous working relationship with the 45th Space Wing. I, I think it's really good. And if you don't just look at Kennedy but look back at the launch complex as a whole, I think that's really important. And having this money to not only look at how we can improve the facilities, and improve the payload processing, the facilities that we have available to move payloads through at the Cape, um, to take care of some of the environmental concerns that we've had over the years uh, w at the different sites. It's really going to be good overall for Kennedy Space Center, and uh, I think for our nation, if we can move forward, have a commercial capability, have a robust uh, range and processing capability for launching, working together to improve our future. So I, I see it as very positive for the Kennedy Space Center and for the nation. Thanks. General Kaler? Uh, well, a couple of things. Let me make a few observations. First of all, I like the NASA channel. <laughs> <laughs> I watch the NASA channel, <laughs> and I've always wanted to be on the NASA channel. So, um, you know, I, that's the first observation I would make. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, sec second thing uh, that I would say is, and I would just pile on to the comments that have been made about how space is woven into the fabric of how we live today. Uh, you, you only have to look as far as GPS to see something that was. Uh, built and intended for national security purposes that has now found itself uh, woven through uh, everything we do, literally. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. Air Force finds itself in a very interesting position with GPS that we are now doing something for planet Earth. And uh, it's not a position that a service always finds itself in, but we've embraced that and, and we think that we've become pretty good stewards of all of that. Uh, and so that leads me to the third point, which is partnerships. Um, since the beginning of the space age in the United States, 
the United States Air Force and NASA have been partners. And we see that partnership uh, being uh, enduring and, and we think we've been pretty good partners together over the years. So I would just uh, make as an observation that uh, as we go forward, I think that word needs to resonate with all of us, uh, partnership because uh, I do believe that, that this continued partnership is gonna be very important for us. So that leads me to the next observation, which is opportunity. And uh, I would uh, echo what Bob said, particularly with investment opportunity in this 21st century launch complex. Uh, you know, the partnership that we have over the years, uh, and certainly the one that we've developed here, uh, you can go out and see where the boundaries are between Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center but it's a fence boundary only. We can't view that as a boundary as we look to the future. I think that there's more advantage and opportunity in not seeing that as a boundary than there is in seeing it as a boundary. So we're encouraged by the investment opportunity that, that I think we've seen out of, out of uh, NASA and how we might leverage that with investment that the Air Force can make and how we can go forward together. The final thing that I would say, and the final observation I would make, though, is there's, there are challenges. And uh, someone talked about the industrial base. And uh, my view is that as we go forward together, we've got to be mindful that this partnership and this opportunity that we have has got to make our industrial base better. Because we do have some really significant challenges here. You know, we, the Air Force and NASA have leveraged one another over the years in investment. NASA has invested in certain kind of propulsion or the Air Force has invested in something uh, and, and we, have, we have fed off of one another as the years uh, have gone by and I think that will be very important as we meet this industrial based challenge as we look to the future and, and make sure that we are being mindful of, of uh, this partnership that we've had for all this time. Great, thank you very much. And just a follow up to that to stick with the, the local theme is that as I think uh, folks have recognized that the president has announced this economic development action plan for Florida. We're gonna be focusing $40 million in the administration's uh, budget on this with this task force that he just mentioned due on his desk August 25th. John Fernandez is here from the Department of Commerce. If we could get him a microphone, I just want to uh, mainly ha have people see him and have him give us a few more details uh, about how the Commerce Department is gonna work with the local communities here. John is the Assistant Secretary at the Department of Commerce for economic development. Great, thanks, Lori. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, I'll be brief. I, I think the um, most important part about moving forward with uh, this part of the plan is really that it's gonna be the region's plan. Uh, to respond to the uh, changes that are gonna occur here, uh, to absorb some of the employment issues, but also to accelerate the commercialization, business creation, job creation elements of uh, what's gonna happen here. Is it really has to be from a much broader regional uh, perspective. And uh, you know, in the coming days as we uh, map out our uh, team uh, and start accelerating the development of the plan that the President's asked for, uh, you certainly can expect to see me around here and I need, to, need all of your help. It's really gonna be the region's plan, not ours. Uh, we can't parachute in here and tell you what that plan is, but we certainly can help uh, you uh, help us as we uh, put together this kind of strategy to move forward. So I look forward to working with you all as we go forward. Thank you very much, John. And, and, and now I'd just like to rise it up a bit to that general economic development and innovation uh, issue that really underpins this uh, budget and our whole uh, space economy that we're hoping to help create. With Esther Dyson, I, I see you here and you're the chair of our uh, innovation uh, and technology subcommittee of our NASA Advisory Council, so if I could get a microphone up front. You have worked in the past with uh, sectors that have been transitioning from government to the private sector, and I wonder if you have any advice for us and things that we can do to do this more successfully. Th thanks, Lori. Yeah, not only have I worked, I watched the transition, not the end of mainframes, but the rise of the PCs, which became an incredibly vibrant industry. I watched the internet turn commercial and I've seen a lot of things. I'm also a journalist, and so my natural instinct is to disagree <laughs> and to be cynical, but this, <laughs> this stuff is all believable, and the reason it's believable is because I have seen it happen before, specifically with the internet. When, when it started to go commercial, when the government said, look, we'll, we'll, we've done the fundamental research, but 
you guys, you turn this stuff commercial, send it, sell it to normal people. Uh, the equivalent of space tourists were companies that used the internet to promote sales seminars, and there was a huge controversy that the sacred internet was being used by these sleazy commercial people to do marketing things, how disgusting. And I'm here wearing a Space Adventures jacket. Uh, people would put logos on spacecraft, how terrible. But in fact, these commercial energies are what create new industries. Uh, everything we've described today is stuff we already know about. What's exciting is things are going to happen that we don't know about. We're going to start mining asteroids. We're going to start creating pharmaceuticals in space. We're going to discover all kinds of things. And a lot of it may be frivolous. People will go up into space and you know, Buzz Aldrin danced on whatever it was, dancing with the stars. Pretty soon somebody will be dancing in the stars. And they'll spend money and other people will get jobs allowing people to do things that are both scientific and useful, but also things that are frivolous. And I love it. I fund these companies. And I think when we talk about jobs, there are going to be lots of jobs created by small companies you've never heard of that don't even want government funding. They're just going to be out going do, doing new things. OK, thank you. That's, that's really interesting. I, I do think that there are a lot of similarities in space. Has uh, We've protected ourselves thinking we're special. And we are special, but that means we can uh, even do those things, as you mentioned, that we can't even dream of yet. Uh, but on the jobs topic, let me just, while I have Carissa Christensen, who's the head of the Tory group, who I know recently did the research uh, that the, we're, um, I believe it was released a couple days ago, that talks about the President's plan, thanks, and how uh, job creation with this uh, budget exceeds uh, the previous plan. Could you talk about that study? I, I would be delighted to, uh, Lori. Um, what we looked at specifically was the number of jobs that would be associated with NASA's expenditure of the new uh, the budget line item associated with commercial crew and commercial cargo. Uh, it was an arm's length study, uh, independent uh, estimate. Uh, people come to us when they want good information for decision making. We uh, uh, developed the numbers using a, a federal economic in, uh, input output model but called. What do you mean accurate? Uh, that is our intent, okay. absolutely. And Neil, <laughs> Neil knows me well and uh, uh, has heard me speak many times on the fact that the, the firm that I founded, its purpose is to provide objective input to decision makers. So that Neil means not good as in desirable in terms of the, we, the, the output was known before we started, but accurate, uh, uh, methodologically rigorous. You can go to our website and uh, see a presentation that for almost all of you will be deeply boring, but I believe satisfying in terms of the specifics of the methodology that we used, the model that we used, the scenarios that we looked at. So the question was, for this $6.11 billion uh, over five years, what would be the jobs that would result from that? And the numbers uh, that came out from that were an average of each year as you spend that money, just from spending that money, about 11,800 jobs. The spending profile of the budget varies, so the jobs vary. Uh, from an initial ramp up year of about 7,500 to a peak of about of um, more than 14,000. The other point that I want to make that I think is very important here is that this represents that direct spending by NASA on commercial providers, private sector providers. It does not uh, attempt to estimate the jobs that will be developed that will result from the attraction of additional investment in those companies. So I think that it's, our intent was to provide a, a, a very a credible number specifically associated with that budget to support decision making. Very interesting. I can't help it since Neil chimed in. And, and Neil was due to be at one of the other panels, but cared the most about harnessing space to expand economic opportunity. So tell me, Neil, why uh, for this panel, I, I have heard you speak on this uh, topic in the past. And I, I know you have strong views about it. I Yes, I do have some strong views, and many, in fact, I think are unorthodox, so if I may share them with this panel uh, and, and this audience. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, May, you speak, you speak marvelously about all of the impact that spin-off products can have, spin-off technologies can have on the quality of life on Earth. There's no doubt about that. However, there are other sort of spin-offs from other industries that also improve the quality of life. And so what you've described, while it happens to come from space technologies, does not sit uniquely among things that can change people's lives. 
because they can look to other places for things that change their lives. I guess the point I'm making is that here, uh, how does the public distinguish NASA as a means of improving their lives from anything else that goes on in a, in a funded society from improving their lives? Because we're trying to make that distinction. And if we can't make that distinction, we cannot justify in Congress to have NASA get more money than some other agency that claims to be stimulating the economy. For example, the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health, where science is getting funded and there's tech transfer in those, pro in those, in the, in those funding umbrellas. So what I claim that's behind all of this is that it's not simply that you have a spin-off technology. It's that you stimulate somebody to want to be a scientist in the first place. And no one's really mentioned that. We say, well, there's a program and, yeah, sorry. You say, well, here's, some, here's, a, um, here's a program that'll help people become scientists. I submit that there's a more powerful force that no one is identifying here. It's not that you funded a program that promotes scientists, it's that NASA does something that makes people want to become scientists even without programs. And when you, have, when you infuse, when you, when, you, when you ignite an entire educational pipeline of ambition, because NASA has the ambition, then everything else falls into place, everything because you have people who want to be scientists and they'll dig up the, 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 they'll go to the libraries and they'll visit the museums and they'll uh, knock on doors and they'll find people to talk to. Um, in the 1960s, I don't know that we had all these programs that everybody's talking about to try to stimulate interest in science because you didn't have to try to stimulate it. It was in our face. Everybody wanted to do it because there was a, a bold mission that NASA had laid out in front of it. So I want at some point somebody to say that the, when we're ready to go to Mars, we start selecting that astronaut class, and maybe that astronaut class are middle school children at that time, given the time delay, and then the media, or even elementary school, okay? And if that's the case, then you start picking who those kids might be. And then the press follows them and looks at their grades, and all of a sudden the whole country gets involved, and everybody wants to become a scientist. That force transcends any program that you can just sit there and say, here's to stimulate here, and the minorities here, and the college here, it's bigger than that. And when that program becomes visible, then it's an easy sell to Congress. It's an easy sell to the public. Uh, and this is what I can I can I can sure, I jump in there sure, and, sure. and jump on the bandwagon with you because unfortunately the inspiration part I didn't really get to because I was being truncated I think that's exactly what happens and growing up in the 60s as well uh, we saw that there was a I was not uh, I didn't wasn't any of some of the there were programs out there but I wanted to be a scientist and nobody was necessarily telling me how to be it so I absolutely agree and you see that there was a rise in folks who wanted to go in the sciences as a direct result it's that that challenge that we get I think that it's absolutely there and we do need to say it more loudly and more more often sometimes we get stuck in the woods with with the pieces that we have but I absolutely agree with you it's that inspiration and that just do one thing when I went to China I went to China in their space program the kids were going wild because they had their space, had their astronaut there, and I think we went wild the same way, and we wanted to follow in their footsteps. So I agree with you 100%, and thank you for, for clarifying that. And uh, Lori, if I have one other quick note uh, about the col the the collaboration that you uh, spoke of, uh, I I ask the question because I come to this kind of as an academic, and so when I see potential problems, I think they're kind of cool to solve, not that they're problems to worry about, but problems to bring smart people to. What does it look like to another country when we say our civilian space agency is partnering with the military branch of the government? What does that look like to them? To us, it looks fine, because you're, you're sitting right next to me, and you're a nice guy, and, we, and you bring security to our country, and so of course there'll be a collaboration. To another country, it's the military marrying a civil agency. And I ask, if we see another country start a space program, and then they say, oh, by the way, there's an entire military branch that's going to be married to that. How do you react if you see that happen in another land? I'm sorry, does that... Does it's a rhetorical that? question. Okay, yeah. I'll address I'm sorry. it. Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm just looking at the geopolitics of that. Okay. <laughs> Let me let well, Dale respond real quick, and yeah, then I have to wrap I, up. I, I guess, uh, following on the point you just last made, I guess I see us needing to 
industrial base issues, I, I think we're going to require a certain level of, of integration between the civilian and the military agency. But I, I guess I was more inspired by the charming young lady who had to leave with the Space Adventures t-shirt or, or jacket that uh, it, it dawned on me that maybe a way to deal with the perception in the uh, out uh, third world or whomever of of because I know it will arise and and I hope somebody questions it. We somebody's paying attention about the military joining with the civilians. But uh, a dear friend mentioned to me yesterday when when I was talking about uh, being in Colorado and other things like that and and bringing in the commercial and he said people have got to understand that space is way too important to leave it to the federal government. And that w I think one way we deal with that issue is we're not only joining the civilian with the military, but more importantly, we're bringing the larger, ultimately more innovative, ultimately more resourced capabilities of the commercial sector so that we're getting the frivolous, the, the, the goofy, um, the money making uh, I involved in it. And I think that to me is what I find most inspiring by what the president's rolling out is he's really trying to change the paradigm. God, I hate that word. Change the, the concept of how we even look at space. And uh, to me, your comments earlier about in the 60s, we didn't have to have programs. And I agree because I, I grew up here. Um, and, and, and I think we've lost that as a nation. I see it still as viable in Brevard County because Brevard County, uh, our school system here because of the space program is vastly superior to any other major county in the state of Florida. And that's in no small measure because the kids who go to school here, their parents, you know, work in a space program. They go, when they sit around the dinner table, they're talking about space related things. And I think, absolutely, absolutely. And, and what we need to do is, 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 as you said, is broaden that so that other people at other dinner tables in, in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, and elsewhere are talking about this issue. Okay, thank you. We've gone o over, but I appreciate you being here. I do um, think that in the future you'll have to remind me Neil can stay in the panel that he intended to. So, <laughs> Actually, I do uh, want to address your, your concern about the partnership, as I think both um, uh, Director Cabana and General Kaler stated, this is not a new partnership. This partnership has existed for, and it is not a merging of our, of our programs at all. We have extremely distinct budgets. I do not think there's any concern. In fact, as a nation, we believe, uh, as has been stated, this is an important way to collaborate to get a better value for the taxpayers so that we can do more and provide the economic growth as the commercial uh, sector uh, leads into this. And as far as inspiration, uh, no one can say it better than the president did today, that that is ultimately, as you said, Neil, why we are doing this. Uh, and ultimately, we believe that will be the important way we draw uh, students and uh, I think adults alike into recognizing that we are leaders and our great nation, ex great nations explore and we intend to be one of those. And to the extent that that is helping to develop our economic base, all the better. So thank you very much for being here. We're all going to regroup and head back to the buses and we'll see you back at the uh, ONC. We're going back.